Paperboy here, uh, back again. Today I'm going to do a presentation, just a quick presentation on the development of the Trinity. Uh, the reason why I wanted to do this is because there's a lot of um, hyperbole sometimes going around, misconceptions, lies, uh, mischaracterizations of the Trinity and where it came from. And basically what I wanted to do is demonstrate to people, uh, you know, those who are within the faith and maybe those who are researching Christianity about the Trinity. How did we come up with this doctrine? Is it uh, biblical? Is it from Roman pa paganism or what? Um, so basically, I want to start off with the passage of... Um, <laughs> of um, no worries. So basically, uh, I want to do start off with the passage from Hosea and it says for my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge and the reason why I want to start with this is because I think within the Christian uh, circle sometimes we need to know our history you know even though we believe the Bible is the word of God one of the strongest uh, things that Christianity has for itself is historical evidence and you know we have the scripture and external historical evidence that supports the Christian narrative. Whereas when you look at other faiths, generally they are purely based within the text. And when you look at the claims outside of the text, you generally don't find anything. So one thing it's really important for people to know the history of the Trinity and the church in its earliest development. So I'm gonna start looking at <clears throat> what the actual early Christians believe. Okay, so in the wane of Wayne, in the, in the words of Wayne Grudem, he says, the word Trinity is never found in the Bible. Although the idea represented by the word is taught in many places, the word Trinity means tri-unity or the three in oneness. It is used to summarize the teaching of scripture that God is three persons, yet one. What are some of the circular claims about Christianity? Dennis A. Beard says, the doctrine of the Trinity did not exist until 325 AD. Dan Brown, everyone knows Dan Brown. He says, Jesus, establishment as the son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. It was a relatively close vote at that. By officially endorsing Jesus as the son of God, Constantine turned Jesus into a deity who existed beyond the scope of the human world, an entity whose power was unchallengeable. We have P.R. Lackey, who also says, at Nicaea, a whole new theology was formally canonized into the church. And Robert Spears says, it is an unquestionable historical fact that the doctrine of the Trinity is a false doctrine foisted into the church during the third and fourth centuries, which finally triumphed by the aid of persecuting emperors. Says the Watchtower Society, says the testimony of the Bible and the history makes clear that the Trinity was unknown throughout biblical times and for several centuries after. What I want to go into is just now look at our next slide. And it says, for example, in Matthew 13, 18 to 19, and this is why Christians have to be very discerning of the deceptive nature of many circular uh, scholars and people for, of other faiths, atheists and so forth. And it says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. And this is why I want people to listen attentively as to where the doctrine of the Trinity came from, whether it's from paganism or something else. Now, what I want to highlight to people, and on this map, it highlights the spread of Christianity. And we can see in the purple, by 185 AD, we see Christianity had spread around the east and the west of the Roman Empire. And then we see by the time of Constantine, it had spread throughout Europe and dispersed quite widely. So why I want to highlight this is because before uh, 1313, when we had the Edicts of Milan, Christians were generally dispersed around the regions and there was no real ability for all the bishops to gather together 
to cement what Christian doctrine was. So even though they believed the same things, there was usually the same thing described in different languages. And when uh, you had the Edict of Milan in 1313, this meant there was a freedom of religion, and this meant the Christian bishops could gather and then discuss on doctrines. So what I want to show you is that even Bart Ehrman, no talking about the growth of Christianity, because many people try to claim that Christianity was spread by the sword. But this is in fact a, a, a lie, because for the first 300 years of Christianity, Christians were persecuted, it wasn't an official religion of Rome, and it wasn't like other religions where it was spread by the sword. And this is what Abba Ehrman, an even uh, atheistic scholar, says. He says, in the triumph of Christianity, Ehrman describes the Edict of Milan as the Western world's first known government document to proclaim the freedom of belief. And he goes on to say, Christianity probably made up 7-10% to 10 of the population of the Roman Empire. A mere 100 years later, half the empire's 60 million inhabitants claimed allegiance to the Christian tradition. So Ehrman then declares that this is absolutely extraordinary. Very little about the historical triumph of Christianity makes sense. When Constantine converted, the New Testament did not formally exist. Christians disagreed on basic theological concepts, amongst them how Jesus and God were related. For those living at the time, Ehrman writes, it would have been virtually impossible to imagine that these Christians would eventually destroy other religions of Rome. And this is why I want to talk about the early beginnings of Christianity. How did Christianity grow? Because what we see is that there are a lot of circular scholars who make theories of why Christianity grew. But the problem is when you look at the Christian texts, from even starting with the Gospels, it makes sense. But then when you remove these core facts from the beginning of Christianity, it then becomes bewildering to anyone who does not subscribe to the Christianity, the Gospels, or the historical documents from the Church Fathers as to why Christianity grew. But in the, as we go along in the presentation, I'm going to describe or read out some of the earliest witnesses of the Christian traditions or what people witnessed and why Christianity grew. And then I want people to consider what actually makes sense. If you put together the Christian narrative or you look at the fragmented circular or sometimes Islamic argument about the origins of Christianity. Because what you have to do is look at everything holistically. And what I generally find is when people make, uh, they make theories devoid of the Christian tradition, then it doesn't add up as to what the whole narrative was. So I'll continue. In Macmillan, this is what he says, Macmillan, in the, his book, Christianizing the Roman Empire. And he's a Christian, and this is what he writes. He says, the best explanation for the rapid expansion of Christianity in the first three centuries was not due to the church's strategic use of literature distribution or the friendliness and the kindness of missionaries. It was not the endorsement of the state, the promise of prosperity, or even the church's care of the poor in the community. Nor was it the love and relationship between believers. People did not choose to become followers of Christ because of the social status or so psychological benefits afforded by the Christian faith. Rather, they embrace Christianity primarily because of the persuasive influence of miracles that were, pers that were experienced and attested through the Mediterranean world. And this is one of the most important things of the growth of Christianity. If we look, for example, at Michael Green, he says, it is an interesting fact arising from all this evidence that exorcisms were done in an evangelistic context they were so clearly designed to back up the claims of the preached word. Eusebius, in the third century, wrote, evangelizing with God's favor and help, since wonderful miracles were wrought by them in those times, also through the Holy Spirit, as a result, assembled crowds, every man of them, 
on the first hearing, eagerly espoused piety towards the maker of all things. So even Eusebius is attesting to the fact that what helped Christianity grow was the ability of Christians to perform miracles. And this was what caused crowds to gather and people were forced to accept the piety of the people that were doing the miracles. And Augustine says, I should not be a Christian but for the miracles. Now this is why I'm saying look at some of the other religions, how they spread by, you know, by the sword or even the earliest people, they will say different things. But even the early church fathers are saying, I would not be a Christian if it was not for the miracles, their own testimony. But these are some of the things that circular scholars have to disregard and then try and come up with a theory as to why Christianity grew. But they're then rejecting source evidence. Are miracles biblical? Well, we look at Mark 3.15. It says, He appointed the twelve of them, whom he designated as apostles, to accompany him, to be sent out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. We see in Luke 10.17. It says, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Ephesians 6.12, what does it say? It says, for we wrestle, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we see even from the scriptures, it testifies, it testifies to the power of Christians that Jesus gave the ability for people to work miracles, to use us in their evangelizing. We also see in Origen, and he says, and this is an early Christian, and he lived in the 235, third century. And in writing against Celsus, who was not a Christian, he's trying to present an argument for the Christian faith. And he says, and there are still preserved amongst Christians traces of that Holy Spirit which appeared in the form of a dove. They expel evil spirits and perform many cures and foresee certain events according to the will of the Logos. And although Celsus or the Jew whom he has introduced may treat with mockery what I am going to say, I shall say it nevertheless, that many have been converted to Christianity as if against their will some sort of spirit having suddenly transformed their minds from a hatred of the doctrine to a readiness to die in its defence and having appeared to them in either a waking vision or a dream at night and also he says and the name of Jesus can still remove distractions from the minds of men and expel demons and also take away diseases so the earliest Christian writers patristic fathers some of them they write about the testimony of the Christians and the miracles that they were performing. And this is what convinced Christianity to grow. Because that's why I read out to you Bart Ehrman's statement saying that the growth of Christianity was a phenomenon.